I'm Sharon Bill, welcome to my Theory Tuition series where I'll lead you step by step through each of the ABRSM Theory grades. There are lots of resources available to help you on my website. If you visit SharonBill.com, you'll find some free PDF information sheets. They're available in US letter or A4 to accompany each step of this series. There's also a page with links to all of my YouTube video tutorials and you can access information about the books that I have available. I've written how to take your ABRSM music theory exam. It's full of tips and techniques on how to best prepare for your exam and also how to best make use of the time when you're actually in the exam room working through your exam paper. So if you visit SharonBill.com you'll find it's all there. If you can give me a like that'd be really great and subscribe to my channel to keep updated. There's lots more in store and so we're going to press on now with section I which is uh, originally it starts on page 33 but we're going to do quite a bit of skipping ahead. So if you turn first of all to page 33 and I refer to this as section I. And so if you want to turn in the PDF documents to section I, it goes over two pages and I just give you lots and lots of different pointers to help you to work your way through this exercise. However, before we get stuck into this, there is a couple of things for us to consider. Uh, most importantly, it just needs to be explained that this no longer occurs on the exam paper. So from 2018 onwards, you will not be required to compose a melody on your exam paper. In previous years, there was a choice between uh, composing a melody to given words or composing a melody to um, a given extract. Uh, you got that choice, whereas now it won't occur at all. However, I am going to have a little look at a, a part of this with you because it's just um, a valuable skill to have as a musician. It also helps you to understand the music that you play. It helps you to sort of get behind the music that you play and understand how those um, melodies and pieces are constructed. And also, if it is that you at any point choose to progress on to the more advanced grades, this composing a melody is a vital part of that. So if you wanted to move on to grades six, seven and eight at any point, it's really, really important that you do get to grips with this. However, I would suggest that you go straight to the composing a melody to the given extract. I would miss out the composing a melody to given words, um, purely for the fact that you'll be doing the same thing twice. Adding a rhythm and then a melody to words um, has no new information added in from grade four that the adding a melody to the given extract will um, not also include because you need to know how to construct the melody and then whether you choose to add that to words or not is your own choice. However, the melody to words won't really help you to advance towards the next grades whereas if you turn with me to page 39 this is kind of the foundation for uh, constructing composition in music generally and if you wanted to add words to it you would still need to follow this formula. So I've given some pointers and so a lot of the things that I'm going to be saying you can find in this PDF document section H so you can always refer back to these two pages just to re refresh your memory on what I'm going to be talking about. And then we'll put that into practice with just this first exercise. But of course, what I write and what you write would be very, very different things. It's just a matter of um, making sure that you include certain aspects within your composition. And also there are lots of tools to help you to compose a, a musical, a well-phrased melody. Because uh, obviously in an exam scenario, you're not going to have... Uh, uh, your instrument to hand to play through what you are composing. In practice we can perhaps just play through what you've written to make sure it sounds nice and musical. If it doesn't there's usually a reason why and we can discuss those, those reasons and we can sort of map out a piece of music that will sound nice 
just by following certain rules and certain guidelines. And so um, we always need to be aware that whenever we're writing a melody, even though we're writing single notes, you are always, always implying harmony. So before you begin, you always need to know what key you're in and you also need to know what chord you are implying. Even though you're only playing single notes, you are always, always implying a harmony. And we need certain harmony at certain points of the melody. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just show you by choosing this exercise A and we'll discuss all the points that need to be um, borne in mind and then you will just need to reapply those aspects. Of course we need the answering phrase to sound like it musically belongs to the given phrase. The que if you imagine sort of a question and then answer, they need to feel like they belong together. And there are techniques that you can use to do that. You can either echo rhythms that they've given, uh, or you can use similar style of music but moving it up and down the stage that's called a sequence where we do the same thing so here we have that dotted rhythm that's moved down a step you could then move that descending rhythm up a step you could invert it so instead of moving down in step you could keep the rhythm the same but move it up in step alternatively you can take little fragments of that rhythm and use those little fragments to keep some sort of musical similarity so let's just have a go at exercise 1A and I'll talk you through the various points of consideration. And so, first of all, we need to decide what key we're in. And so this B flat might first of all suggest that we're in the key of F major. However, the C sharp will tell us that we're actually in D minor because there's our raised seventh. And so we need to just map out our triads for D minor. So let's just, as we would off for the naming the chords, one, two, three, four, five. So we're in D minor, so chord one is based on D. So stepping upwards, D, E, F, G, A. So making the triad, of course, if you want to just visualise the first, the third and the fifth. So chord one is D, F, A, E, G, B, F, A, C, G, B, D, A, C, E. Chord three isn't a chord that we need to use. It requires special treatment. It's a slightly strange chord, so just avoid that one. And if I just make a little sort of observation, each of these chords has its own characteristic. And I'm obviously greatly simplifying this, but chord one is kind of the home chord. It sounds finished. Chords two and four are good filling chords. So also is chord five. Chord five is the chord that particularly leaves you hanging. And so you'll find that more often than not, the end of the phrase that you be given ends on harmonies based around chord five. So here, here's our given opening, and we can see that we've ended on an A. Before that, we got a C sharp and an E. We can see that all of this is basically implying a chord five, which is going to leave you hanging. We began on a note F, which is part of your first chord, which is your home chord, which sort of establishes the key. Chord two is a good filling chord, and it's also a good leading chord to chord five. Chord four is a, a similar function, and um, it's also a good chord. It doesn't sound finished, so it's not a sort of a home, this is the end sounding chord but it's not as strong as this chord five, which really leaves you hanging. We also need to be aware of the range or the capabilities of the instrument. For example, if you're writing for a flute or an oboe, you wouldn't write everything with um, absolutely no room for a breath at all. If the musician's got to play this whole thing, you need to make, and it's going to be uh, at a super slow tempo, you need to be aware that perhaps they can't breathe, um, or they will need to breathe 
within that. You also need to be aware of the range of the instruments. So if it's uh, one of these treble instruments, don't get so low in the treble that you're actually dropping off the range of this instrument. So a, a little bit of general knowledge from this instrument. However, if you stay not too far out of the register that they started with, you know that you won't be too far wrong. So let's just map out how this is going to look. No musician would ever just start at the beginning of a piece of music and just splurge some composition in the hope that it'll just sound beautiful after being overwhelmed with inspiration to compose. There's always some underlying structure, even on pop music, you know, we're quite aware of the fact that it's always verse, chorus, verse, chorus, middle eight chorus and so on or whatever the uh, accepted formula is classical musicians composed within uh, structures like sonata form or rondo form of course we we're always led to see that they break the rules a little but there's always some structure and so we're just going to look at the most simple structure that's underlying a simple eight bar uh, phrase or, or melody and so just to show the beginning and the ending, I'm going to put this in two halves. I know that ordinarily you compose it in one long line and so I'm just going to obliterate these parts of the manuscript and so we can see that there's the first part, there's the second part. And so you can just see bar one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They're quite short bars because there's only two beats in the bar. Just tidy that up. And so we know that we're in D minor and I'm going to compose this for a flute. Um, just because I play a bit of flute myself and so I'm comfortable knowing that the range of the flute um, ends with middle C at the top and we've got octaves and octaves of range higher up that uh, I could choose to use but I'm going to stay within this given range and I'll know that will be correct and also it wouldn't be very musically balanced to suddenly go way off in the high register. So we've got our chord, so I'm just going to map out, so here's the treble clef, the key signature, the time signature. If we move on to another line, we only need the clef and the key signature, the time signature is only at the beginning unless we have a change in time signature. So I'm going to just copy out their question phrase, their opening phrase that we need to complete with an answering phrase uh, to give us a full eight bar melody. By all means sing this through in your mind or just give it a little play through on the instrument of your choice but I'll just show you how we can see what exactly what's going on. Here we've got an F going down to a D, back to an F. We can see that it's all sort of meandering around this chord one. These in-between notes, we can just refer to those as passing notes. It's just fill in notes as we're passing through. We're just centering and wandering around this um, chord one. Got a little bit of a hint of chord two or chord five to fill in, but that's just wandering in between, always going back to this chord one. And then we've already seen how this E, C sharp, A is part of chord five, which is leading us to this halfway point. So we'll just phrase all of that's so our halfway point. And because we're ending on notes of this chord five, it's not going to sound finished, it's just going to leave us hanging. There's more exercises. We've got a whole chapter on this later in this grade five book where we'll be looking at these ending points or cadence points in more detail. But we just need to know that we need a chord five to be implied here so it doesn't sound finished. And we definitely need a chord one here at the very end so that we know that the piece is finished and reaches a musical conclusion. 
And so now we need to think about making a musical response to this given opening. Don't forget, I'll put a mark here, C sharps, we always need to keep raising that seventh. Ordinarily, the seventh rises to number eight to sort of um, resolve. However, here, because it's part of the same chord, they've made like an arpeggio of it to show that it all belongs to chord five. Now, I don't want to just keep copying what's here. I feel like we've had lots of this sort of stepwise an arpeggio movement so I'm going to just now move the music upwards in another direction however I think I'm going to make use of this little bit here these semiquavers seem quite characteristic so I'm going to make use of this bar here a sort of a featuring rhythm so I'm going to repeat this A it forms a sort of an ambiguous note because it's chord 5 or it could also be part of chord 1. So I'm going to use it now um, to carry on A and then I'm just going to, I'm going to carry on with their stepwise. I'm going to sort of use this sequence here where you use something that they're giving you and just move it around the stave. So we have A, B, C sharp. D, that's one bar done. And so if I now go in just sort of uh, quavers, E, so here's a chord two or a chord five, a nice fill in, E passing through. So we've got lots of an E and a G with in between passing notes. So I'm going to go back to the E. So I've used this bar here as basically centering around chord two. So this is a chord one, chord five kind of bar. So I can beam all of those together. And then I'm going to use their arpeggio, however, I don't want to end on, a, on an A, which is sort of ambiguous. I'm going to let that rise to the D. And then we've definitely ended on our home note, home chord, tonic, absolutely finished. Now, that's the structure of the piece. There's nothing too clever about it. We've just stuck to the basic triads. In fact, I don't think I've used a chord four hint at all. I've just centred around the E, F, G of the chord 2, back to chord 5, chord 1, and we use aspects of their given melody to show some musical similarity. However, that's not musical enough yet. So we've got the actual notes, but we now need to make it musical. We can see that there's the first half and the second half, so we'll phrase those, and then that shows that the Flautists can perhaps take a breath there if they need to. But also I'm going to give some articulation marks. I want those to be separated into twos. Da -da -da -da. I think we'll have a little bit of um, staccato there. I don't want these slurred though, so I'm going to put a new two mark to show that they're full value but separated to give them a little bit more emphasis. We need to choose a tempo direction. Now, if you're not desperately sure, you can just choose something like moderato or andante. Keep it um, reasonably um, sort of open to uh, not being too um, specific. And then, unless you think it should go desperately fast or desperately slow, but I'm just going to choose... Um, Moderato, I think. I just want a moderate pace, nothing too outlandish. Moderato. And then I think I'm going to begin mezzo forte. And then as it descends, I think that makes a natural diminuendo. Of course, in your finished copy, you won't have these chord symbols. I've just included those just to show you the musical structure that I've centred this composition around. So we've had a bit of a diminuendo. However, I think we'll have a bit of a crescendo for a grand finale. 
we've got some articulation marks, we've got a tempo direction, and we've shown the two structures. And so, of course, what you would write would be very different to what I write. This no longer comes in the exam, as I've said before, but I do recommend that you have a little bit of a go of this, uh, particularly if you consider moving on to later grades. I hope that's been helpful to you. If you can give me a like, that'd be fab. And please subscribe to my channel to keep updated. There's lots of information on my website. The PDF documents that I'm referring to can be found there. So please visit SharonBill.com and have a look at all the resources available to you there. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.